again to the Harry Potter squad where we learn while we read. Today we're going to find out what we learned while reading part two of chapter 30 of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Chapter 30. The poison. The pensieve. The president. Not the president. <laughs> the pensieve. The first lesson from part two of chapter 30 is that Lucy's reaction to Severus Snape is, well, just listen. Snape, he shouted, Severus Snape! Snape has been cleared by this council, said Crouch disdainfully. He has been vouched for by Albus Dumbledore. No! shouted Karkaroff, straining at the chains that bound him to the chair. I assure you, Severus Snape is a Death Eater! Dumbledore had gotten to his feet. I have given evidence already on this matter, he said calmly. Severus Snape was indeed a Death Eater. However, he rejoined our side before Lord Voldemort's downfall and turned spy I for us. I wonder why he's so mean. He used to ooh, be a Death Eater. Yeah, he did. Oh, do you think he turned good yet? I'm yes. I'm uh, Dumbledore believes in him. Snape. Severus Snape? Yes, Severus Snape. <laughs> so Jojo the Epic often gives his theories about what's going to happen next in the books. Remember, this is his first time through, so no spoilers, and it's interesting to just see his mind work as he's figuring it out. Let's find out what he thinks is the reason that Ludo Bagman got accused by the Wizengamot. Harry couldn't believe his ears. Ludo Bagman, a Death Eater? <laughs> Only, said Bagman, smiling awkwardly. Well, I don't. I know I've been a bit of an idiot. One or two wizards and witches in the surrounding seats smiled indulgently. Mr. Crouch did not appear to share their feelings. He was staring down at Ludo Bagman with an expression oh, of the uh, utmost oh, severity I, I, and dislike. I, I, I get what's happening, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? He's face to face with greatness? No. No. What do you get? What's happening? We took Jesus. You Is think that... that she wrote a bad article about Ludo? The next thing we learned in part two of chapter 30 is what a temple is, or at least what J.K. Rowling is referring to as a temple when Barty Crouch is rubbing it during his, the trial of his son. Harry looked up at Crouch and saw that he looked gaunter and grayer than ever before. A nerve was twitching in his temple. Bring them in, he said, and his voice echoed. That's the part of your head that mommy is touching. The anatomical temple indicates the area behind the eyes on either side of one's face. Two bones and one muscle constitute the temple. They are the temporal bone, the sphenoid bone, and the temporalis muscle. Mr. Crouch is massaging his temporalis muscle due to stress. When you are stressed, you tend to grind your teeth as well as introduce extra chemicals to your brain. Both cause stress headaches. Many people find relief from stress headaches by massaging the temporalis muscle. This works in two ways. It distracts from the pain and it loosens the muscles that tighten when we grind our teeth. The temporalis muscle has had its name for a long time. The ancient Romans called it the temporalis muscle because temporalis means time and the sideburns on the temple are often the first parts of our hair to gray as we age. The next lesson that we learned in this chapter is just how cool the pensieve is. Now there's a lot to learn about the pensieve. We're going to focus on just one thing. What is it? Harry asked shakily. This, this is called a pensieve, said Dumbledore. I sometimes find, and I am sure you know the feeling, that I simply have too many thoughts and memories crammed into my mind. Uh, said Harry, who couldn't truthfully say that he had ever felt anything of the sort. At these times, said Dumbledore, indicating the stone basin, 
I use the pen sieve. Only sim one simply siphons the excess thoughts from one's mind, pours them into the basin, and examines them at one's leisure. It becomes easier to spot patterns and links. You understand when they are in this form. You mean that stuff's your thoughts? Harry said, staring at the swirling white substance in the basin. Certainly, said Dumbledore. The Pensieve is interesting in too many ways to discuss in a short video. It has received more scholarly attention than any other magical objects in the books. Philosopher Amy Kind has said that she would rather have a Pensieve than a wand. In this video, we want to talk about what the Pensieve implies in the Potter universe about the mind-body problem in philosophy. The question is whether the mind is a material phenomenon dependent on the body, or if the mind is immaterial and not dependent on the body. Those that think it is material, like Thomas Hobbes, are called monists, and those that think it is immaterial, like René Descartes, are called dualists. Rowling gives us a third possibility here. Of course, there is no question that for Rowling, the mind is physical. Memories are slimy strings of substance that can be extracted, manipulated, viewed, lost, and recovered. But while physical, the mind is not dependent on the body. It can be transmitted, at least in part, to vials and pensieves. Very interesting. Thanks for listening to our second video. My favorite lesson is about the temple. It was interesting to learn about the bones and one muscle. But don't forget to like and subscribe. Potter Squad out! My favorite part is with Voldemort.